The Germanic languages are known for having a lot of vowels. In Swedish, there are 18. In Dutch, there are 24. And my own dialect of English has 20. Proto-Germanic, the ancestor of all these languages, was no different, with 14 phonemic vowels, plus a fair number of phonetic variants. But while the modern languages have many different vowel qualities, the ancestral system contrasted only a few of these, with the distinctions instead being primarily of length. The language had four phonemic short vowels, five long vowels and two overlong vowels, as well as a few diphthongs. While these length distinctions have survived to some extent in the modern languages, the original system as a whole does not, being mixed around in various ways in the daughters. Exploring the entire history of this system across all Germanic languages would be interesting, but would take far too long. So for this video, let's just focus on six vowels in the three most spoken Germanic languages, English, German, and Dutch. These are all West Germanic languages, so share more similarities with each other than they do with the Scandinavian North Germanic languages, such as Swedish, Danish, or Icelandic. However, these vowels had not changed from Proto-Germanic at the time when West Germanic had split from the North and East languages, so any similarities we see here have occurred either independently or under aerial influence. Also note that for this video, I'll only focus on the main outcomes of each vowel. In reality, the picture is muddier, as vowels split and merged in different environments, especially under the effects of umlaut, but I'll mostly ignore this here. Our six vowels are the long back vowels O and U, the long front vowels E and E, and diphthongs AU and I. These three front back pairs have behaved about the same as one another in all three of our languages. U has generally behaved similarly to E, as has au to i. The long vowel e is a bit of an exception, as the West Germanic languages all lowered it to a, so it diverges from or here. Let's start by looking at German. In Old High German, the first recorded form of the German language, the long mid vowel o was diphthongized into the opening diphthong. O, which in Middle High German had become O. In Modern German, this has monophthongized into the long high vowel U, which is represented with the letter U. Overall, it appears to have simply been raised, but we do know from medieval documents that it's passed through these intermediate steps. As mentioned, the long E is lowered to A in West Germanic languages, and into German it simply merged with other sources of the long A, and did not change from there. In writing, German doesn't distinguish between the short and long A's, so it just represents this as A. As long O is raised, it doesn't merge with U, as the two long high vowels break to form diphthongs AU and I. This happened only in modern German, with the original long vowels persisting in Old and Middle High German. We actually know that they passed through the stage of being higher diphthongs before being lowered in the contemporary form of the language. Orthographically, the front vowel has preserved its earlier form, being written EI, whereas the back vowel is written with a more contemporarily phonetic AU. But while these long vowels avoided merging through this diphthongization, the original Germanic diphthongs did not in turn shift away from these. We do see a change in Old High German, with the diphthongs shifting upwards to O and A. 
In early modern German, when the long vowels broke, these therefore merged with the pre-existing diphthongs, which likewise then opened to au and i. So overall, German raised or lowered the mid-long vowels and merged the high-long vowels in with the diphthongs. Next, let's look at Dutch. The Dutch changes to the mid-vowels will look very familiar to you, as they undergo exactly the same sound changes as in German. The same diphthongization, weakening and monophthongization, and the same lowering. The only real difference is in the orthography, with Dutch writing its oo sound as a digraph oe, and writing its other long vowels by doubling the letter of the short vowel. The high vowels are where we begin to see divergence. Like German, Old Dutch initially preserved the long vowels of Proto-Germanic. In Middle Dutch they likewise still haven't broken, although we do see the back vowel fronted to U. But then, in the path to Modern Dutch, these two vowels do break into diphthongs. The unrounded vowel becomes A, while the rounded vowel becomes O. These are both written with digraphs. The unrounded vowel preserving the spelling of the earlier long vowel, and the rounded vowel using a digraph with I. The diphthongs are also treated differently to German. Whereas German just raised them, but kept them diphthongs, Old Dutch monophthongized them to O and E, replacing the earlier O and E of Proto-Germanic. These have survived in this form right through to modern Dutch, completing our set of vowels. But before we move on to English, there is actually one further part of the story of Dutch to look at. Here I've outlined the high vowels and diphthongs, as they are in modern standard Dutch. But in fact, this is not the final state used by many contemporary speakers. In a number of areas of the Netherlands around Holland and Utrecht, which are collectively known as the Randstad and contain around 45% of the Dutch population, some of these vowels have been further lowered to form a picture a little more similar to their German counterparts. Our two standard Dutch diphthongs, plus the additional standard diphthong O, have been lowered to become I, I, and au, while our two long mid-vowels, plus the vowel e, have broken to form diphthongs a, o, and o, to replace them. Finally, let's look at English. Our first vowel here will again be very familiar, although it takes a bit of a different route to the other two languages. In German and Dutch, this vowel diphthongized early on in the old stage of the languages. But in English, it doesn't, remaining in its same Proto-Germanic form through Old English, as well as right through Middle English. It was only around the year 1500, right at the end of the Middle English period and the start of Early Modern English, that this vowel changed, shifting straight up to U, where it has more or less stayed to this day. English spelling generally reflects the way words were spoken in Late Middle English, so even though this vowel changed its quality around 500 years ago, we still use a double O to write it. Since this vowel seems so similar to German and Dutch, you may expect the long e vowel to be similar too. Unfortunately, this is not the case. The vowel was lowered in West Germanic as we've seen, but while most other West Germanic languages simply kept it as a long back vowel, in Old English, as well as Old Frisian, the low back vowels were instead fronted to meet it. This long low vowel was later raised to air, except in the West Saxon dialect of Old English, 
which, while it was the most prestigious literary form of the language at the time, was not the dialect from which standard modern English derives. From here, the development of the vowel perfectly mirrors that of the back vowel, remaining a long mid-vowel until the end of Middle English, where it raised to E. Also just like the back vowel, its spelling preserves the Middle English pronunciation, using a double E. The long high vowels likewise follow a similar path as the mid vowels, and end up quite similar to in German and Dutch. Like or, they didn't change through Old and Middle English. Then, during the Great Vowel Shift in Early Modern English, undergo a change. But since these are already high vowels, they don't raise, instead breaking into diphthongs, which give the Modern English ow and I. The spelling of these two is a little weirder, however. In Old English, they were both written the same as their short equivalent, as was the case for all long vowels in the language. In Middle English, this persisted for the front vowel. However, the back vowel came to be written with the digraph O-U, which was how the sound was written in the late Old French, spoken by the invading Normans. The front vowel then came to be written with a silent E at the end, for reasons we won't go into here, other than that it marked the preceding vowel as distinct from the short equivalent. The back vowel usually didn't receive the same, since the digraph already marked a long vowel, although it was added for aesthetic purposes if a word ended in S, as we see in our example here. Finally, we come to our two original diphthongs. While the English vowels so far haven't diverged too far from their continental equivalents, the diphthongs are where it does get a bit weird. I've already mentioned how the West Germanic low back vowels were fronted in the development of Old English. This included the back diphthong au, which became au. We then see the effects of another change, wherein diphthongs shifted so that both elements were produced with the same height in the mouth. They could either be low, mid, or high, but couldn't start and end with vowels of different heights. In addition to this, they were lengthened, so that they contrasted with newly created short diphthongs, which came from the breaking of short vowels in certain environments. This vowel in Middle English monophthongized to the long open mid air via a near open intermediate, which later merged with the higher vowel as e. The original distinction between this and the other long mid vowel is mostly preserved in spelling, with the other being written e e, and this lower vowel written as e a. Now, you may have noticed earlier that when I showed the fronting of the A vowels, there was one form missing. While the short and long monophthongs and the back diphthong were fronted, this is not what happened to the front diphthong I. It isn't that this sound was immune to the fronting, but rather when the fronting occurred, I no longer existed. You see, the fronting, as I described it, was actually not one, but two sound changes. To start with, only the long back vowel fronted, where it merged with the long front vowel as we've already seen. We then see the front diphthong monophthongized to take its place, before the short back vowels are fronted. This leaves only a long back vowel R, which has remained distinct from that of Proto-Germanic throughout. This is the form this vowel stays in in Old English, but it was raised to OR in Middle English, in the same process as affected its front equivalent. From here, however, it does not behave as the front vowel does, instead diphthongizing into a vowel O, which in modern British English has become O.
Spelling-wise, it does one of two things, either behaving as its front equivalent, using a digraph OA to mark as a lower O vowel, or using a silent E, as we saw with the long I vowel. So, that brings us to the end. Overall, you can see how these sounds are related, and there are strong similarities across all three languages, but there are nevertheless some peculiarities. As I mentioned, we've only looked at the main outcome for each of these vowels, so the system is actually far more complex than it may seem here, but hopefully this has been a good introduction to the subject. So, thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next video.